normally we have a presentation of about 100 plus slides. Today we don't. Um, so we actually, uh, as it's uh, all about questions, we decided to ask each other questions. And we have some um, images that go along with it. Um, so let's just start. This is Jeroen, I'm Dre. Talia has introduced us as uh, Haas and Han. We have been working on a project called Favela Painting for the last um, 10 years. And here you see us in front of um, one of our better known artworks, uh, which we finished in 2010, this was, right? Yep. And um, so let's dive right in. I think that the most the, the question that most people ask us first is um, uh, how we got started. But um, I actually like to remember more like why did we get started? <laughs> well, let's do both a little bit. Um, I went to Brazil for the first time in 2002. Oh, there's a beautiful picture of how young. Um, yeah, and, and uh, in 2002 I went to Brazil with my uh, design school and I ended up in a favela in Sao Paulo doing a design project. I won't go into that, but the thing that really amazed me there is that the young people I met were a lot like me, and they li liked the same music, which was hip-hop at the time, and it really made me feel like a sort of responsibility because my life was so different than theirs, but we were so the same, that it felt like I wanted to go back. So um, I decided to make a documentary about hip-hop, and I had invited Dre at the time, and this is a picture of us discussing this, uh, the making of this documentary. Uh, more than 10 years ago, about 12 years ago, uh, in Sao Paulo. And if you go to the next slide, you see the our friends we met and uh, the young guys making hip hop. And this was kind of an opening for us to think, wow, we, they are so much like us, yet their lives are so different and they deal with so many different kind of problems that we fortunately didn't have to deal with. And we were born into a situation with so many possibilities that we felt this kind of our moral compass both started to point in this direction. We want to do more for and, and try to do something. So uh, we decided to paint um, and see if we can change something through changing the exterior of this, these neighborhoods that the rest of Brazil looked at as drab and brown and unwanted. And we felt that was not warranted because these communities were actually super interesting, built by people themselves and amazing. And um, so we started painting. That was kind of the plan, right? Just paint and see what would happen. We wanted to paint on a huge scale, but we were just starting. So th first we thought, let's make a small painting. So we painted three houses. And we did that together with uh, local people that we had met in the community. This was one of the harshest communities actually in Rio, Vila Cruzeiro it's called, uh, run by, you know, there was no real government or police presence. It's really run by a drug gang, but there was a lot of conflict. Um, we stayed in that neighborhood and uh, here's a picture of the two kids that were painting with us. And then after that, we decided to make another painting um, a year later, which was much larger, we painted a whole street, took eight months to make, um, and that was a river with koi carp, to us kind of a symbolic idea of swimming upstream, you know, um, going for your hopes and dreams. Uh, this we did with some of the with some of the same guys that are a bit older now, and they invited their friends, so they came and worked with us. And we worked there for eight months during a period of lots of fun and barbecues, but also a lot of hard conflicts and shootouts between police, military, and the local drug gang. Um, after that, we continued to Rio to another neighborhood and made a painting in 2010, uh, which you'll see now. Uh, that was with a larger group of about 30 people. Um, and after that, that painting became kind of famous, and we were asked to do the same thing in Philadelphia, where we painted over 50 buildings in an uh, avenue in North Philadelphia, together with the Mural Arts Program, a big art program in uh, Philadelphia. And this, we just kept on going. From there, we were invited to go to Haiti, uh, where we painted for about two years with a local crew. We weren't there the whole time, but the crew continued, and we were working with local organizations and people we had met there. And here you see a picture of the community uh, talking about colors and color preferences to see what will be done with houses. Uh, here's a picture of some of the results. From there, we moved to Curaçao, uh, an island in the Caribbean, where we also worked with young people and did workshops and painted buildings. And our next phase 
was going back to Europe about 10 years later and working with refugees. Problematics much closer to home and therefore also closer to our hearts, not closer, but closer to our hearts as well, uh, to see if we can f somehow work with this idea of these people uh, coming to Holland and, you know, the, all the conflict and discussion around it to see if we could do something positive and in a group with them. Here's a picture of a painting we did with them in Utrecht. And uh, here we are actually in a refugee camp in uh, Greece, a camp called Skaramangas, where we had two days of painting, so it was a simple tryout, but we're actually going next week, we're going to Lesbos to continue uh, work there. So that is about, you know, from the beginning to now, uh, it's about 15 years, 12 to 15 years working together. Impressive. You know? um, so the, the, the question that people always ask us is, um, so uh, c can we put you in some sort of box? Like, where do we put you? Are you guys artists? Are you urbanists? Are you activists? Is it social work that you do? Uh, how do we define that? Well, we've al always found that very hard ourselves because you try to, you know, apply for funding and things. So you, you maybe art funding or social funding. You know, applying for funding is one of the big things to make these projects run and takes a lot of our time. But the, the nice thing about art is that you don't really have to define it, but art can be a window through which you can see things differently or which, through which you can discuss or show things differently. And I'd like to refer to the, the people who won the, the Turner Prize, the Assemble people in, 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 in England or in Liverpool, where they also use this as a way to explain why they still thought it was art, even though to them it maybe wasn't even that important if it was art or not. But I think art is just a nice, flexible definition that you can use. Right. But at the same time, we create plays. I mean, it, it, the, the art projects create these kinds of stages of where things happen, like stuff happens there. Yeah. And then somehow I think that art is the key. It makes it easy to enter because every time when people ask us, like, can you explain what you're going to do? And then when you say, well, it's art, then people stop asking. So that, that always really helps too. And yeah, in that way, the images kind of explain themselves. Because if you, if you see an image of this brightly colored favela, something never, people hadn't really seen before that time, um, it, it didn't need much explanation to, to go from this, this image of buildings built of raw brick and then buildings stuccoed and colors all over it. But it's not just as simple as that, of course, because as I said before, um, like trying to find money for these things, right? Yeah, so that was actually the first kind of contract that we wanted to talk about, going into social contracts. Is the, the first contract that you do is the contract with your, with your partners and your funders. And um, uh, we, we, we wanted to start off with, that's actually the, the, the first contract that you need to make in order to be able to set all the other ones up. And uh, fortunately, we're now in a position that we've done this so often that um, funders get the fact that it has th that these projects are flexible and weird and that you can't promise stuff. And that if they ask, like, how many, like, what exactly are you going to do that we're f finally free enough to, to re respond and say, we don't exactly know yet? Yeah, so when you're applying for funding, a lot of the times you have to explain beforehand exactly what you're going to do. If, the, if, it's a, if it's a cultural fund or a development fund, you have to tell how many houses, how many people, and you have to basically l outline all those things, even though this territory, working in a favela, is a completely unchartered, and it's super hard for us to predict how this is gonna work, you know? Sometimes our work would be delayed for months by either war, or by rain, or things like that, or, you know, people would leave, or people would love it and stay, or, or we'd w get way too many people asking for jobs that we couldn't, you know, give them at that point. Um, but, some, but sometimes you work with a co corporate sponsor and you kind of have to, have to talk about return on investment, like how many social media posts are they gonna get and things like that. And also the, like the attention span of a corporation tends to be very short. So if you get this company on board, you know, and they get enthusiastic and give you some money to their project and you wanna build up a relationship with them, uh, oftentimes, within that company, they're, you know, they'll just lose interest or somebody else will be on the board in a few months, and it's hard to build that relationship, and sometimes it does go well. Like, but uh, yeah, and, some, and then you can marry it, basically. Like, yeah. like, I think that the last year we've been working in a favela where we basically couldn't promise anything, couldn't really measure anything, but we could still, still sell the story, so it was funded by uh, um, a, a f um, whiskey brand. And they enabled us, by telling the story, to actually go into this neighborhood 
and really work quite freely and flexible. Yeah, so we, re we returned to the same neighborhood where we had already been working and doing projects for 10 years. And the nice, nice thing about Johnny Walker, and I guess it's another one of these contracts that you, that you could call a social contract or all the different kind of relationships you need to do things, is that w all we sold them was say, you got a good story. And they didn't ask us exactly what they would get visually or but they wanted to be part of this story, which, which I think is a good approach for... But then a whole other bunch of contracts come in place, right? Because then in, in, this, in the neighborhood, you basically you, you have written and unwritten contracts. You have a contract like built of responsibility and, and trust with the neighborhood, with the people, with the crew, with everybody. Can you, like, can you show some examples? I'll, I'll run through it if you give, explain what we're seeing. Yeah, so uh, th th it's, these are not just contracts. I mean, contracts are the relationships you have with people. It's also the dedication you have to make certain things work. And at the same time, it's the way for yourself to measure kind of if your su project is successful or not, if you're getting ahead, if you're improving. One of the things we look at to see if we're doing a good job is to see how many lives we're directly affecting through a project. So uh, the amount of people that we can employ uh, in, in all our projects, we try to employ everybody who works with us. So it's the amount of people that we can employ uh, and train, the amount of people whose houses are, for instance, improved by this, uh, and other, other elements of, of you know, human interaction that this project can cause. At the same time, we're working in neighborhoods like, for instance, Villa Cruzeiro, which has a terrible name. You know, in Rio, people, if you say, I, I'm going to Villa Cruzeiro, I work there, some people just walk away because they, they, they're related to terrorism. So for us, one of the successes that we can talk about or the advantages of doing a project would be to have positive media coming out of this neighborhood, which, as you see in this image here, is usually like Villa Cruzeiro on a weekly or sometimes daily basis would be in the newspaper, even on the cover, like this. And then it is actually also a really tough and hard place to live. So we had The Guardian write this about our project. And then, you know, many, many uh, Brazilian newspapers followed suit. So for the people living in that neighborhood, that was one of the first times that there was some positive news coming out of that neighborhood. And I think that for us is a me measure of success because it kind of says something about the identity of the place. And after that, um, with this project, that started to happen internationally. So the advantages of this is that you can address the problems of these neighborhoods in an international level through something like art uh, on, a, on a more free and open way to discuss things. And the next thing that we thought it was important is that other people started to be inspired by us and we started to be asked to do talks like on the TED stage a few years ago or like here right now and many other projects are starting to contact us, people ask us for help to do their projects and then finally, something that is just hugely important for us personally and also a social contract in a way, is just the friendships and relationships you build over the time. See, for a, a relationship over 10 years working in one neighborhood, people, you see kids growing up, people become like family. It becomes a real dedication you have to a place. So a dedication, that's one of the values. Um, I, I remember I wrote down, I thought it was a funny thing, um, the first day somebody said, soft is the new heart. And we were talking about soft values, and it, it wasn't really cool in the past to talk about that stuff. But it, it's kind of getting more salon fish to say to talk about, you know, about care and attention and sympathy and trust and stuff like that. Because um, then th that's basically the things that we worry about and the things that that's kind of the relationships are built the relationship with the neighborhood, with the people, and with each other, and with ourselves, are built on, on those type, types of values. And uh, maybe you want to explain some, some yeah, of the things I that I happened that are based on that, that go beyond um, just the deliverable. Yeah, so I think our first contract was basically with ourselves, and that we made this movie, made these friends, and really started caring about them, especially when editing this film, and you're looking at these people for hours and hours that we felt a moral kind of responsibility to say, okay, we need to do whatever we can to include our passion and our art form into contributing something. But yeah. then the harsh reality is that a painting you made 10 years ago just starts to really come off and the weather is harsh in Rio, but also, you know, the, the climate, the, like the political climate is harsh. This, this kid on our painting who was a hopeful 
sign of a kid flying a kite in the neighborhood and a, and a symbol for many of the youth. Who, the kids fly a lot of kites over there. You know, it was actually shot in the head in our, in our painting. And it, had, it was actually riddled with bullets after those 10 years. So we decided in 2012 to go back and felt we were responsible. Also, the neighborhood called us out and said, look, guys, your painting's not looking too good. Are you going to come and fix it? So we said, yeah. Let's do that. And I like the discussion that people in Holland said, no, it's actually it's part of the artwork, so you have to leave it that way. But then if you go into the neighborhood, they say, no, no, you have to fix it. We want to get over that. We don't want to be reminded of that. So th I, I like the way that our values change from b by the immersion of being there. Um, same thing happened with Rio Cruzeiro, th which we're doing at the moment, um, which also deteriorated. And we actually decided to um, make this into a mosaic project with an all-female crew, which is uh, new for our project, um, which you can see working here. Now it looks like this, and this is much more, um, obviously, much more sustainable, and it'll stay there for a very long time, and we don't have to worry about the um, uh, deterioration, as we have to do with paint. So what's happening here? Uh, yeah, if you can go back one slide. So the pa that, that painting we made uh, in 2008, which is almost 10 years ago as well, we felt as responsibility, let's redo it. It was a landmark in the neighborhood, it still is. A lot of people come there to hang out, but it's looking bad. So, but the people who were living around it were still living in houses of raw brick, which you know everybody there wants to plaster their house and finish it, which a lot of people don't have the means to do. So we felt a responsibility towards the people living in the street as well to do their houses. And given that um, paint, of obviously in that, those circumstances, doesn't last so long, we figured we need a new material. And that would be to color the plaster itself so it couldn't fall off. And uh, we talked to a lot of people and experts and things like that because um, cement is actually one of the most har harmful products uh, in, our, in our environment because it costs a lot of CO2 to make. And uh, uh, lime is a more traditional ma material and it over this its lifespan is almost carbon neutral. So we decided to use uh, lime and pigment and tiles because the lime uh, can't produce such uh, vivid colors and the tiles can. So the contrast of those two became the concept of our new design. If you go back, we have uh, construction workers on our new team and this is also a female construction worker. We always try very hard to have a mixed crew. Uh, and here you see some of the process of applying the, the, the paint and the lime. The, the house owners actually get a um, choice of colors, uh, you know, the amount, we have an amount of pigments and colors to choose from. They can choose and pick themselves, so the design is partly theirs. Here see, you see kind of a before and after of how that looks. Um, the next one as well, as you see, we're going for a more architectural approach. It's kind of like exterior architecture. We don't feel so inclined to put art on the wall as street arts or our expression as an artist, more, but more to treat the houses and increase the quality in that sense. And here's another before and after of that. And here, the next image, you'll see the team. We have a team, full-time full -time team of about 15 to 20 people working in Rio this whole year already. And um, some of these people have been working with us for 10 years. And so, Dre, uh, the question I would like to ask you then, so what, what is next? Well, um, for one, we're continuing our project. So we'll be in Greece next week working. Then we'll be in Rio soon visiting our project site. But we're also trying to um, look back a little bit on our work and um, figure out what exactly happened during these projects and during these 10 years. So right now we're setting up something we call the Favela Painting Academy. And it's something that actually does research about the actual processes and effects that this work has because we're always running around with paint and we never have time to actually sit down and reflect on our projects except when we get asked for uh, situations like this. Yeah, so is that a way that the project might not rely entirely on uh, us too, but can start to... That's the idea. All it's right. an exit strategy. <laughs> I like it. Cool. Thank you, guys. Thank you. <laughs>